Welcome to Module 1 of TECM 5190. This lecture introduces some foundational concepts in the course. So first, I'll present you with some evidence that writing style is important for your future professional success as a technical communicator. Second, I'll explore standards in organizations, especially as they relate to written communication. And I'll end by defining the terms we're going to use, style, voice, and tone. Let's get going. We're going to start with evidence that writing style is important for professional technical communicators. Clinton Lanier reports the results of a survey in a 2016 paper. In this case, he surveyed professionals that belong to STC, that's the Society for Technical Communication, the largest professional organization in the U.S. Lanier asked these folks what issues they faced. He received a total of 667 issues and then he categorized them into the four types you see in this donut chart. Shows the percentage of pros who mentioned issues in each category. Issues related to writing style surfaced in three of those categories. So under designing and writing, the pros were concerned about implementing minimalism and simplified English or plain language. Under information delivery, the pros were concerned about adjusting conciseness for mobile delivery of their content. Under the remaining category, the pros mentioned the blending of technical and marketing content. Probably the most comprehensive study on jobs for tech comm professionals analyzed about 1,000 information product and 500 UX job postings that appeared on Monster.com during a couple of months in 2013. The researchers, Brumberger and Lauer, analyzed the two groups of ads separately. Of the 1,000 information product job ads, around half were categorized as traditional tech writing or editing. That's abbreviated TW slash E. Another 25% were categorized as content development or management. That'll be abbreviated CD slash M. Then of the 500 UX job ads, just 5% were categorized as research positions, while 60% were for designers, which is treated as the default title for UX positions. Although these results are getting a little old, I think they're still instructive from my regular review of job ads. I've made copies of the two studies where the data comes from available to you under the to learn more section of the instructional materials for module one on Canvas. This table highlights some of the findings that seem most relevant to our tech comm students here at UNT. The percentages display the proportion of ads that mention skills that are a focus specifically in TECM 5190 writing, research, audience awareness, usability testing, editing, and then style guides or standards. In short, I would say expertise in writing style and the ability to determine the best style for different audiences are both fundamental to the success of every tech comm professional. In part two of the lecture, we'll explore what it means for a company to standardize communication. Let's begin with a definition for a standard. Now, we're going to look at three examples of standards that guide industry practices. The ISO, which stands for International Organization for Standardization, produces standards for all kinds of things. They believe we should think about standards as a formula that describes the best way of doing something. They use teams of experts to develop standards for everything from IT security, quality management, to packaging safety. For example, ISO provides a standard test method for assessing the child-resistant characteristics of packages before they're put on the market for consumer use. So that's one example of an organization that publishes standards for professional practice. Here's another one. IEEE is an organization that specializes in electrical and electronics engineering. They have groups of experts that develop standards for things like highly technical practices, for example, mesh tree bridging with loop-free forwarding. I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming if I was an electrical engineer, I would. Here's one final example. 
FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, also developed standards using groups of experts, this time in accounting. FASB is responsible for the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, or GAAP, that's used by both public and private companies and not-for-profit organizations, as well as state and local governments in the United States. They guide highly technical accounting things like the presentation and disclosure of not-for-profit entities for contributed non-financial assets. The point that I'm trying to make here is that standards are voluntary written documents that set out specifications, procedures, guidelines, all of that to ensure that products or services or systems are safe, consistent, and reliable. Standards benefit both consumers and companies. And of course, I'm sure you're already familiar with some standards for writing in English. Contrary to what some people might think, the standards that appear in a guide like the AP Stylebook or the Chicago Manual of Style were not handed down from the gods. This quote in the Chicago Manual of Style makes that clear. Instead, writing style guides are established by the people involved in creating, producing, and distributing content. If you've taken tech editing at UNT, you should already be familiar with at least the idea that there are a multitude of guides for different types of content in different situations. In your instructional materials for Module 1, I asked you to spend some time reviewing the MailChimp Content Style Guide as an introduction to standards for company-sponsored communication. You're going to start comparing a couple of additional guides this week for an assignment that's due in Module 2. Large companies typically have several interrelated guides to standardize official communication between their employees and their external stakeholders. For example, UNT produces something called an identity guide, which says, I'm quoting, the key to growing our reputation is consistency. This guide outlines the communication standards that will strengthen our brand through consistent visual and narrative expression. It was created to help you understand how to use the elements that make up the University of North Texas brand identity system. End of quote. Although the UNT Identity Guide does include some guidelines for narrative content, they're definitely limited. Uh, for example, they talk about prescribed ways of referring to the name of the university and how to check facts at a linked site. The bulk of UNT's Identity Guide addresses visual presentation. In other words, how to use logos, marks, colors, fonts, photography, and in general, visual design for both print and the web. For instance, UNT Green Online must be hex number 00853E. The bottom line is that UNT develops standards for the way its employees present the university. They do this to consistently influence the way the organization portrays itself and the way it's ultimately perceived by the audience of those communications. Unfortunately, there is no standard terminology for the different types of standards that are used for communication. Liz Moorhead, a content strategist, used a graphic similar to the one I'm showing on this slide to display the relationship the different standards types. A content guide, she says, documents standards for text or copy. A visual guide documents standards for visual design. And a brand guide is a combination of both of these. She calls all three types of standards style guides. For TECM 5190, we'll consider a brand guide as a standard that incorporates everything from other guides, whether they're labeled style or voice or content or design or something else. Here's a table comparing the way your three assigned sources for Module 1 use the terms style, voice, and tone. I know, the lack of standard terminology can be frustrating, especially in the beginning. The way Pope and MailChimp talk about a style, voice, and tone is pretty similar. For TECM 5190, we're going to mostly follow them. I promise you clear definitions at the end of the lecture. For now, I want to consider what it means to follow a communication standard by using examples from a couple of guides you may already be familiar with. When you heard the term style guide, you might have thought back to the writing style guide required by your English teachers. That would probably mean the MLA. 
The MLA handbook is produced by a professional body made up of language teachers and used in academic contexts by students and a few publishers of academic content like research journals for those language teachers. Because these are typically the first guides people hear about, many assume they contain all of the quote-unquote correct rules for writing in English. In fact, guides like the MLA handbook have a very narrow audience, all writing about non-technical content. Probably the most comprehensive style guide in the U.S., the Chicago Manual of Style, goes all the way back to 1891, when the University of Chicago Press opened. It's now in its 17th edition. Shorthand CMOS has more than 1,000 pages in print, more than 2,000 hyperlinked paragraphs online. It's become the authoritative reference work for authors, editors, proofreaders, indexers, copywriters, designers, and publishers. But CMOS has little to do with creating a brand. But it's almost universally used for traditional publishing of books, at least in the U.S. It's interesting to note, though, that CMOS doesn't set out the exact same standards found in the AP Style Book, which is the Bible for journalists. Like CMOS, AP Style is for traditional publishers, um, not specific to an organization, so it's not about attempting to establish a brand. Because much of the content on the web is written by public relations professionals, much of their writing follows AP Style. Here's a specific and simple example of how style guides might differ that I borrowed from an e-zine called Word Counter. CMOS and AP have slightly different standards for using a serial comma. In CMOS, it's always used, so both example 1 and example 2 include a comma before AND. But in AP, a serial comma is not used when the series is a simple one. So example 2 is the same as in CMOS, but example 1 has no comma before AND. The bottom line is content creators need to know what serial commas are. They aren't going to know whether to use one unless they know which style or which standard they're supposed to be implementing. There is no single rule for a great many things. If there were a single rule, there could be a single guide that covered all the standards. Ultimately, this means content creators should not try, even if it were possible, to identify the rule and memorize it. Instead, they've got to know which guide applies to the material they're creating, and then they have to know where and how to locate those standards. You may be surprised to know that Microsoft publishes a writing style guide. In fact, they produced one for more than 20 years. The current version is online only, but there were four prior editions in print. IBM also publishes a style guide. Of those we've discussed so far, these two guides are the most directly relevant to technical communicators, and they both attempt to create and maintain the brand of their organizations. Here's some additional examples of how standards differ. First, both CMOS and Microsoft's guide, we'll call it MWSG, allow authors to use well-known acronyms or other abbreviations without spelling them out the first time in certain cases. Those are the cases where the acronym is already considered equivalent to a word. The difference is CMOS refers to Webster's Dictionary and MWSG refers to American Heritage to determine which acronyms are on the list. In another comparison, CMOS includes an entire chapter on the use of quotations and dialogue, whereas MWSG includes just a few words about the use of pull quotes and nothing about quotations. On the other hand, MWSG includes an entire section on standards for writing for chatbots while a search of CMOS finds no relevant content. Content creators have to know which guide applies to the material they're creating. If you're working on fiction, CMOS will include essential standards for your edits. If you're working on a chatbot, however, it'll be mostly worthless because it doesn't address the standards that are relevant to your content. All tech com pros must understand that a guide is just that, a guide for meeting standards for communicating within a specific rhetorical context. 
Other guides present styles for communicating in other contexts. Let me be as clear as possible here. There is no single correct choice. What's a standard for one audience and purpose is not going to be standard for a different audience and purpose. Wearing formal clothing to a job interview is a standard, but wearing the same clothes to go bowling is not. I asked you to view the MailChimp content style guide because it's often held up as the exemplar in the world of web content and UX writing. It has been incredibly successful in establishing a clear brand. They published the first version on GitHub in 2015 and made it available under a Creative Commons license to anybody who wanted to use it. Many web content developers have adapted it for use in their own organizations. When asked why MailChimp developed their guide, Aaron Cruz said, it's more of a resource for people at the company who are in other disciplines and find themselves writing content for MailChimp. We don't staff every single team with a content strategist. Style or content guides are the primary tool for building consistency in the written content produced by non-traditional publishers. In other words, organizations like MailChimp or Microsoft or IBM. Now that we've thought a little more about standards for writing within non-traditional publishers of content, I'll provide you with some definitions in part three of the lecture. So these are the definitions I promised you a little earlier in the lecture. I've inserted some examples from MailChimp's content style guide. Style focuses on mechanical issues. A standard for style might deal with capitalization in URLs or email addresses. MailChimp wants those in all lowercase. The final column shows an example where the standard has been applied. Voice focuses on distinctive personality achieved through language. MailChimp's content style guide says they're plain spoken. They use plain language. The final column shows the wording of a legal statement about terms of use. In case you think that that isn't plain language, let me show you the counterexample MailChimp provides from their legal writers. Finally, tone focuses on distinctive personality adjusted for rhetorical situation. MailChimp wants employees to think about new or frustrated users when determining how much information to provide. The last column suggests that a chunk of information could be deleted from a user guide and replaced with a link to additional information. So you may be surprised to figure out, we're actually not gonna talk that much about style in TECM 5190. It's a primary topic in TECM 5195 on tech editing. But please keep in mind, we're gonna be focusing in detail on voice and tone for the rest of the course. It's okay if you don't feel confident about the differences between these yet. You're gonna get lots of practice and feedback in the coming weeks.